We have a problem with our next guest. It's hard to find any of his act that we can actually show on telly. Most of it's R-rated or worse, and it's all pretty blue. Here's a taste. A cricket legend, old Australian boy. A real bloke's bloke, and we all loved him for it. But he's got a super problem, and it's affecting his game. So won't he put your wanger away? The interesting thing is, without any mainstream airplay or media interest, he's sold more than three million albums in this country alone. It would seem he may know something about Australians that his many critics don't. Ladies and gentlemen, say hello to Kevin Bloody Wilson. You paid for this audience? Where did your love of bawdy ballads come from? When I was a young musician, uh, I required a couple of albums of bawdy ballads and barroom songs and songs like and the hair is on a dicky dido hung down to her knees all of that sort of stuff yeah i think most of us have heard those songs and i, I ran out of them I basically had two albums and i ran out of them so that i started writing my own when did you realize you could make a living out of doing this playing in bands in uh, kalgoorlie in western australia um we used to just mess around with other people's songs uh, you know take the ribbon from your hair would become wipe the dribble from your chin stuff like that and uh, uh, playing in a, a town like Kalgoorlie you had to play everything like Wednesday night you'd do a pub Friday you'd do a blue light disco Saturday you'd do a wedding and Sunday mornings we used to do these uh, things called pleasant Sunday mornings which were just for the boys at the footy clubs and the cricket clubs pleasant <laughs> very pleasant Sunday morning yeah. my job was to introduce the strippers and draw the chook raffle in those days <laughs> So you had the classy end of the morning. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So you're in Kalgoorlie and you'd started changing these songs around. Uh, was there a moment you thought, well, hang on a minute, people are really going for this? Yes, there was. Even when we were doing the decompositions, as I call them, other people's songs, uh, you'd always get more response to that than you would the original version of it. So I thought, yeah, this is good fun too. It was, it's not like it was hard work. It was always good fun decomposing other people's songs. Let's go back one. The invention of Kevin Bloody Wilson. Where did the idea come from? It's a great name. Very smart. Thank you. Well, I've got a brother called Kevin, an adopted brother called Kevin, and uh, I just borrowed his name because he's the biggest yobbo I know. Uh, the Wilson is a fairly common name in Australia, and uh, the Bloody uh, came from the fact that uh, I needed to let people know that it was Australian, and second, that it was of a, a bawdy nature so that people didn't get confused when they came to my show as to what they were going to hear. And 83, you bought out your first cassette. Yes, yeah. it was. Average Australian Yobbo. Can you take me through some of the songs that you wrote for that album? Some of the, because a lot of people here wouldn't be familiar with your work. Uh, stack the Fridge and Stoke the Bong. <laughs> um, that Fucking Cat's Back. <laughs> oh, there was an instrumental on it because we ran out of songs. We, we, I had 11. And uh, being a musician all my life, when you make a mistake... Uh, on guitar, you usually say, ah, oh, fuck, you know, to yourself. So we, I wrote an instrumental called, ah, oh, fuck. A bawdy instrumental. A bawdy, yeah, the first of, I guess. The whole idea was to play this, this piece of music, uh, this pattern of music, but the very last note in it, you had to fuck it up. And when you did, the whole band stopped and, ah, oh, fuck, one, two, three, four, bang, back into it again. So the fiddle player got to fuck it up, the guitar player got to fuck it up. It was really good. <laughs> I'm going to send this interview to Gordon Ramsay. So I can think I've done. <laughs> You've got your guitar here, and look, I think uh, how many people here are familiar with Kevin's work? Yeah, we've got about sixty percent. So forty percent need an education. <laughs> Why don't you give us a, a blast or something? Certainly. Bearing in mind that this is a family-friendly show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the Manson family. So I'm the Manson right. family. Okay. This is a new one. No. Tonight, I'm sitting watching old home videos Sorting what to keep and what to throw away Since you left, you left them with me Now I think I've solved the mystery of how it all turned to shit In fact, I even know the day That's why I play our old wedding video backwards Dream of how things could have turned out like Starts when you give back the ring Walk backwards up the aisle again Slide your ass back into that limousine Fuck 
fuck off there out of my life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> On the basis of that romantic song, it seems like a, <laughs> an appropriate moment to say hello to your wife, Betty. Hello, Betty. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, this man, when you first met him, uh, who was he? What was he like? Well, he was Brian Dennis when I met him. Um, I thought he was cute. Yeah. When I first saw him. <laughs> he was in Kalgoorlie, and I'm from Kalgoorlie, but I had moved to Perth. And, but I used to go back there quite a lot to visit uh, relations and my brother. We used to go to the races a lot. And the Foundry Hotel was the place to go. Yeah. Uh, and him and his band used to play there on about three or four nights a week. Was he doing the decompositions then? Uh, just a little bit, you know, the same thing, singing straight songs and dropping in that odd word. So um, I'd be sitting there and you'd just look around and wait for the reaction every time he dropped a word in, everyone would go, oh, did you hear what he said? That's, you know, that's basically how I first heard it and it was pretty funny. I used to get quite a lot of laughs out of him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because a lot of Kevin's music is about, you know, women are sheilas and good sorts and they're good for a root or a head job and that's about it. <laughs> true, true. Was he a romantic? I'm going to ruin his reputation here, I know. But yes, he is actually. He buys me flowers and uh, all of those things. So You're yeah, really fucking up my reputation. <laughs> I know. I said I have to tell the truth. Um, it can be. can be a lot of times, yeah. But... Um, He's still got that cheeky, irreverent side to him most of the time. Does he try out his uh, material on him? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> All of it? Yes. <laughs> so when Kevin, for instance, comes in and he's just penned nothing funnier than a fart, for example? <laughs> um, that one, I just went, I just sort of shake my head. There's a few of them that I've said, I can't believe you're going to do that. That's how I know I've got a hit on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> they're usually the best ones. I go, oh, I can't believe you're going to do that. And he does it, and they're usually pretty big hits, so... Because <laughs> there's plenty of people go, this, this stuff is beyond the pale, this mm -hmm. is tasteless, it's not appropriate. Why do you think it works? Because it's appropriate to the situation. If you and I were to take uh, our wives out to dinner and a piano player in the corner broke out into one of my songs, I'd be the first bloke to go up and chat him about it because it's inappropriate for the, the environment. But if you come to my show, certainly that's where people pay good money to come and see exactly or come and hear exactly what it is that I do. So what is it you reckon people get out of it? Is, is, are you saying the things that they don't get to say? What is it? I think so in a lot of cases because uh, I believe that political correctness is a crock of shit. It's a contradiction in terms for a start. If it's political, there's a real good chance it's not fucking correct. <laughs> so Betty... <laughs> <laughs> You know, Kevin's catalogue is, uh, is pretty broad. Uh, another one that springs to mind is my dick just dialed your number. <laughs> I know uh, Kevin signs a lot of women's breasts that they often ask oh, their breasts. Yeah. Why do women go for it, do you think? I really don't have any idea on that one. I just, <laughs> no, it's kind of not something I'd probably do. Um, but, yeah, they just seem to want to do it. And it just, oh, they say, how do you put up with that? And I, just, and I just say, well, it doesn't really matter. It's only... It's only a boob, and he's going to go home with me. He's not going to go home with them, so it doesn't matter. Is he always creating stuff? I mean, are you in the car and he'll see something and um, there's a thought, like I, I just saw... A... He, has a, yeah, he has a very creative mind that doesn't go to sleep very often. I'm so interested in this because you work in a genre that very few people work in, the, the bawdy ballad. Where does an idea start? Oh, it could start anywhere. I, uh, there's, there's no set time for creativity. It's sort of like if you're playing rugby, you get past the ball, so you've got to run with it. So I'm always armed with a pencil and a little piece of paper so that if an idea does turn up, uh, whether I'm at an airport or whether I'm sitting on the dunny, uh, which is a good inspiration place to be, <laughs> given the nature of my songs. Mm. <laughs> I assume it's the office. <laughs> <laughs> to a degree. So, uh, again, when the flow starts, you've just got to sit with it and let it work itself out. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, there's a double entendre. <laughs> I think it might have been a single one. But then... <laughs> what song are you working on at the moment? Uh, at the moment, uh, there's one that I'm working on about uh, diesel dyke lesbians. Uh, it's called Butt Fucking Ugly. <laughs> OK, now this is where it gets interesting. 
This is what I'm trying to work out. Are you sitting at home and it's just there? Are you driving along and it's just there? What gives you that idea? Uh, the lesbian one, I suppose that comes from an incident that happened to me in Belconnen. We were playing in Canberra and I went to my favourite food hall for a bit of tucker, a bit of chow, and there must have been some sort of protest going on because my favourite food hall had been overtaken by these unwashed protesters. And as a result of that, I was forced to sit opposite this thunderous diesel dyke. <laughs> so she got this plate in front of her and it was about the size of a baby basket and it was just full of all this green stuff. There was lettuce and cabbage and bean spouts, the whole lot. And um, she was woofing into it and around about then my steak turned up. And she looked at me and she said, you know how that animal died? I said, yeah, you starved it to death, you fat plate. <laughs> You didn't say that, did you? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> did you? <laughs> so when you, when you said that, how did she react? She hit me. <laughs> Seriously? Yes, yes. I also got knocked out by a lesbian in uh, Alice Springs as well. <laughs> they don't sort of get it. Mm. They don't get it. But what is it they're meant to get? You're not exactly showing them a great deal of respect, are you? Fuck them. <laughs> I think I rest my case. <laughs> You said your mum didn't like your act. What did she say to you? Well, mum and dad were living in Lismore, and when I was touring Lismore, mum would always come to the show, but she'd never go inside the theatre section. She'd always stay outside and talk to Betty. But dad had always come to the show, and he loved it. And finally, I, I got to play at the London Palladium. And so we took mum over there with my brother and his wife. They looked after mum, and she ended up in the Royal Box at the London Palladium. True story. It's a dream for you. The Palladium certainly was, yes. No, the Royal Box, there's a whole song. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing your work for you. Now. I don't know about Royal Family of late. That uh, I can't believe that Prince Charles left Lady Di for that Camilla Sheila. <laughs> you wouldn't fuck her on a footy trip, would you? <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> So there you were at the London Palladium. I'm sorry, I sidetracked it. <laughs> the London Palladium, and Mum was there, and she saw the show for the first time. And this is probably about, oh, a good ten years into my career. And at the end of the night, she came backstage. I said, there you go, Mum. I said, that's what I do for a living. She said, Dennis, you're very, very funny. And then she, <coughs> give me a backhand. <laughs> she said, but you still swear too much. When you played the London Palladium, that was one of those, uh, I'm sure I can't believe I'm here moments. Yes. Right. I, I have those moments almost every day. Seriously, because uh, I never ever thought that what started out as a hobby would be such a, a career. It turned into a career. And there's nobody more surprised by the success of it than I am. Why do you reckon your thoughts uh, always head towards the crude? What is that, do you think? Oh, no, I do write straight songs. Uh, I've had uh, a number of songs recorded by other artists. Um, uh, Slim Dusty recorded two of my songs on his 100th album. There are some particular people that know you, though, an, an unusual list of fans. Let's go through them. Kerry Packer. Hmm. How did you know he was a fan? When he died, uh, there was a, a thing in the paper by one of the football players in, in Sydney, one of the rugby players, and he told the story in his column about uh, how he was driving in Kerry's Rolls Royce, and Kerry said, you've got to listen to this, and stuck my stuff on. So I didn't know about that until he, Kerry died. The one which I find harder to get my head around is Prince Charles. True story, yeah. Uh, we're playing in a place called Usk in Wales. And uh, th after the show, I do the signing. I always stick back and do the signing. And there was about four or five blokes in suits waiting back, so I picked them as being coppers. And this guy <laughs> said, I'm from New Zealand. I'm on secondment to the special branch in the UK. And I was moving the boss's car... And as I started the engine up, this song came on. Stick that fucking phone up, you fucking heart. And, and he said, I, I thought, what, this bloke sounds Australian or Kiwi. So he, he rummaged through the glove box and he found two of my cassettes in there. And uh, he said, you'll be interested to know, he says, my boss is actually Prince Charles. He's Royal Highness Prince Charles, Prince of Wales. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> OK, so I've been listening to your music and in your act... Sometimes in songs, sometimes on stage, you use words uh, like Sambo and Coon and you've referred to your hobby farm as Kick a Coon along and you've been accused of racism. What, what's your definition of racist? Racism is born out of hate. Uh, 
if I was a racist, I wouldn't have Aboriginal artwork on my guitar. I, I love Aboriginal artwork and for the most I love the culture. Uh, Hitler was a racist and, and his stuff is born out of hate. None of the stuff that I do is born out of hate. I'm, I'm just not that sort of person. The words are powerful, though. I mean, words like coon and sambo, they come from yeah, a history I, I don't of hate. sambo. I've never used that word. It's in one of your songs. Oh, it fucking is, too. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Kamal, you sambo. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But these, these words come from, historically, from hatred. They come from dispossession and, and uh, murder and lynching and all of these. They're powerful words, aren't they, to be throwing around? Not in humour. Not in humour, I Does don't Does humour disarm all of that? I believe so, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, again, um, uh, an, an incident, I was shooting a beer commercial up in the Northern Territory and we went out to a, a little place called Owen Pelly. And uh, uh, one of the uh, Aboriginal people, it turns out he was one of the tribal elders of, of Arnhem Land. And uh, he came up and he said, Kevin, if I get you a left-handed guitar, would you play my people some music? I said, yeah. So I sat on... Uh, a, like a table in, the, in, in this quadrangle and I sang Santa Claus and a few of the other songs and, and this same guy came up to me and said, hey, Kevin, you can't live here without singing Living Next Door to Helen. <laughs> Which, the reason people are laughing, that's a song about a group of Aborigines, or Abos as they are in the song, that mm. move next door to Alan Bond and eventually uh, they outdo him and, and he goes off. Yep. He moves out. Yep. Uh, but at the end of the song, or the end of that little performance, impromptu performance, uh, and particularly the part where I get to, at least we don't got fucking coons live next door to us, the whole lot of them, and there's probably as many people here as we were sitting around that table, again, yeah, they went off with it. And at the end of it, uh, when we were about to leave, uh, th this fellow, Nathan, his, name, his English name was Nathan, said, Kevin, come with me, come with me. When I went over there, this shed was full of Aboriginal artwork. And uh, he opened the doors of the shed. He said, Kevin, he said, you take, your, take whatever you want from there. And I said, I can't do that. He said, come on, I want you to take it. He said, because you make our people laugh. Is it possible, though, that your audience, in hearing these words being used, which have been hateful words, that it gives them permission to use them for reasons which may not be for entertainment? No, again, give my audience some credit. They're just normal people like I am. As I say, when mm. I walk off stage, I, I go back to being... Isn't that how that society changes, though, that... that the majority of people, normal people, discard the things which have caused damage and move on from them? Uh, again, uh, without getting too intellectual about it, uh, I, I come back to the simple answer, racism's born out of hate. I can't see that what I do is racist. Have you ever found yourself typecast? Typecast as a yobbo, yeah. Happy with that. Have you ever found yourself typecast in a way you weren't happy? Well, like you and I, for instance, uh, stand up. We're the same height. So you would have copped every short joke that's ever been written, wouldn't you? From myself, mostly, yes. Exactly. <laughs> and, and same here. We, you know, we cop all the short jokes. Uh, I cop all the short fat jokes now because of this. But, uh, again, it's a grain of salt. It's, it's, uh, people, people make jokes about the differences. You've got quite an empire. Now, I mean, I don't know how much money you've made. Obviously, many billions. You've got your own internet radio station. You've got your own television production studios, radio production studios. Yet, as I said in the intro, you've never been mainstream. This is a rare television appearance for you. Is the fact you haven't been mainstream actually contributed to your success, do you think? Oh, I think so, definitely. Uh, the fact that you can't hear my stuff on radio and uh, very rarely on television... Uh, it is part of why it's been successful is because mates have been telling mates about it. Kevin, when you shuffle off, which of your songs would you like played at your funeral? Oh, I've got one. Yep. Oh. <laughs> I was just hoping for a title, but there we go. <laughs> in fact, I'll get you all to join in. I'm the sort of bloke that would like to think that if I could go back in time... And Joe and Henry and even Ned Kelly would all be good mates of mine. Because they're piss pots, poets and outlaws, and I can relate to that. And I can relate to their attitude too, in a word, Dilly Gap. That's spelled D I L L I G A F. Dilly Gap. This is what it means. Do I look like I give a fuck, Dilly Gap? Am I being direct enough, Dilly Gap? 
guess another way of saying I couldn't give a fucking rat's ass, mate. And do I look like I give a fuck? Dilly Gaff, your turn. Do I look like I give a fuck? There you go. Kept bloody noise. <laughs>